Uh, welcome everyone to this Drug Discovery World webinar entitled Multiplexing Specificity and Species Cross-Reactivity Assays in Biologics Discovery. Uh, as we're well aware, uh, biologics are one of the fastest growing classes of drugs uh, with their beneficial therapeutic effects being due to their high specificity and affinity to target antigens. During the discovery process, the ability to evaluate antigen-antibody interactions via multiplex binding assays at high throughput uh, provides more information in the primary screening phase. Indeed, uh, identifying hits by simultaneous evaluation specificity and cross-reactivity builds confidence in potential hits and increases uh, naturally, the likelihood that candidate molecules will successfully proceed through the downstream phases of the, of the discovery and development process. So I'm delighted today to be joined by two speakers who will both demonstrate how high throughput multiplex assays enhance productivity in their biologics workflow. First up, we have Dr. Yana Wang uh, from Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Dr. Wang is currently working in the lead discovery group within Takeda's Oncology Drug Discovery Unit. Uh, she has extensive experience in cell-based assay development and screening um, for both small molecules and biologics. Dr. Wang obtained her PhD in chemical engineering from MIT. Our second speaker is Dr. Robert Ford, who is a senior scientist with Avacta Life Sciences, where he works in the validation team. Uh, his expertise is used to generate data using AFIMA technology in customer internal and collaborative projects. I am Robert Jordan, uh, publisher and editor-in-chief of Drug Discovery World, DDW, and I'm going to serve as your moderator today. At any time during the webinar, you can send in your questions for our panelists by writing your question in the Ask a Question box and simply pressing OK. Uh, the panel will try and answer as many of your questions as time permits at the end of the presentations. OK, um, so I think we're ready to go. So if you're sitting comfortably, let's get started. Um, OK, so Jana, if you're ready, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. This is Yana Wang from Takeda. Today, I'd like to share our experience of utilizing high throughput flow cytometry for antibody discovery and development. Takeda originated um, started from Japan with very long history, and now we are actually expanding footprint globally. We are focusing on drug discovery in oncology, GI, neuroscience, and vaccine. Currently, Takeda is in the process of integrating with Shire, hopefully to be completed early next year. As you see, we are really growing bigger and better and trying our best to be the global leader in pharmaceutical industry, providing best-in-class solutions to all the patients out there. Our group, the Discovery, has expertise in automation and liquid handling. And so we are specialized in high throughput IC development and screening, mainly supporting oncology drug discovery, but also for other disease areas. We constantly leverage our automation expertise to build up different IC technology platforms, such as reporter gen ICs, high content imaging, etc. Based off these automated IC platforms, we have developed a variety of in vitro bio IC as a toolbox for assessing and evaluating different biology. With this, we are able to support various drug discovery platforms, biologics, small molecules, and even cell therapy across different stages, from HTS to in vitro translational studies. Here, I'd like to walk you through how we establish a high throughput flow cytometry platform to fully automate on cell binding IC from sample preparation to data acquisition, analysis, and reporting. This platform has helped us cope with the increasing demand of hyperdoma campaigns for many new targets in our discovery pipelines. Although hyperdoma is a mature and well-developed technology, we are still trying every bit 
to make a faster, better, more efficient process for antibody discovery here in Takeda. For example, as shown in the workflow, we are utilizing humanized mouse as immunization platform. We are deploying clone picks for hyperdoma clone picking. Also, uh, we are using high throughput cloning and transient expression purification systems. All this process is tracked in Gen Data Biologics, um, which allows a seamless and integrated workflow for antibody discovery. So one very important and critical step through the Hyperdoma campaign is to identify clean target-specific vendors very early on. Traditionally, ELISA has been the most popular method to screen vendors from Hyperdoma supernatants. However, the main concern about ELISA is if the recombinant protein used in the assay could really have the right confirmation to review the right physiological relevant epitopes especially after it's bound to surface. Even in some cases, the recombinant protein is not easy to make and get, such as um, some GPCR targets. So ideally, on-cell binding IC would be more physiological relevant to use. But there are some challenges to limit its use as a primary screening tool. Um, firstly, um, the conventional flow cytometers, although widely used, but um, mainly for small-scale research, uh, having limitations in their data acquisition and management abilities. Also, not amenable to automation. So it's very hard to achieve the throughput required for primary screen for antibodies. Secondly, the typical sample preparation workflow for on-cell binding IC um, using flow cytometry involves cell sample preparation, adding primary antibodies adding secondary antibodies and multiple rounds of washes and centrifugation in between each steps. So it's very tedious, time and labor consuming. So here we overcome these two challenges with the help of two enabling technologies, IntelliSide IQ Screener Plus and high res robotic systems. IntelliSide IQ Screener Plus is a full-fledged high throughput flow cytometer exactly fitting our needs. It's capable of acquiring high quality data at fast speed utilizing low sample volume and is also capable of in situ processing and management of a large quantity of data. Plus, it's automation friendly. Last year, we acquired an IQ with three laser configuration, which is capable of 13 color multiplex. Previously, our workhouse flow cytometry was a fax canto, uh, which supported um, screening in, um, only in 96 well format along with manual sample preparation. We conducted side-to-side -side comparison between IQ and Canto. As shown with the data on the right, we had found that IQ could um, not only generate high quality data consistent with Canto, but also achieve this with higher speed and lower volume for sure. high res is known to provide integrated flexible and modular solution to laboratory automation, along with their dynamic scheduling system. So the MicroStar system shown here is a system comprised of six dock positions, which is arranged around a stubbly robotic arm in the center. So individual uh, liquid handling or other small instrumentation could be mounted on carts, and the carts can be attached to these dock positions and accessible um, by the robot. Different combination of instruments can be selected as needed for each IC and exp each experiment. Previously, we have built this system for double agent studies, which are ICs um, to evaluate cell viability after combination um, treatment for small molecule. To fully automate on-cell binding IC from beginning to the end, we have reconfigured this for HTFC. So the key components are listed here. Um, number one, Automated refrigerator, sterile store. This is for cold storage. Number two, ambient storage um, for tip box storage and also um, the automated dispensing multi job for secondary antibody or other reagent dispensing. Number three, automated microplay centrifuge with spin. This is for spinning down cells after incubation. Number four, automated washer, Biotech ER406.
This is for aspirating and dispensing wash buffer. Number five, automated liquid handling platform Bravo. This is for transferring antibody from source to cell place. Um, and number six, the flow cytometer IQ for acquiring data. So we have optimized working conditions for each step on each instrument for the whole process to ensure that the workflow is amenable to most cell types and target types. So we list out the optimized condition at the bottom of these slides. Multiple iterations of automation protocol were tested until the optimized configuration was achieved. The optimized working flow could precisely control each step in the on-cell binding IC process, as shown in this um, gun chart here. Um, this guarantees that all the plates in one run are treated identically and allow fair comparison for all the antibodies in this run. Usually, we could run 10 plates in two and a half hours and read each plate in 25 minutes. This throughput really makes it possible for on-cell binding IC to be primary screening tool uh, for hybridoma campaign. Another challenge we have to face is that it usually requires large amount cells for each hyperdoma screen. For example, um, about 140 million cells for 4,000 clones, about like 10 384, 90, 384 well plates. It takes tremendous work and time on the day of screening just to culture, harvest, label fresh cells with cellular encoder dyes for multiplex. To shorten IC time and keep the consistency of cell quality from run to run, we typically freeze down cells after they are labeled with cellular dyes using quick freezing medium at very high density format. As shown here in the top two density plots, cellular dyes such as um, cell tracer violet or CFDA or some cellular encoder dyes from IntelliSat could be used to label cells at titrated concentration to differentiate cell populations for multiplex purpose. These label cells could survive free cell process, um, showing little difference when comparing to fresh cells, as shown in the two plots um, at the bottom to the right. Sorry, to the left. Um, also, it shows great run-to-run -run repeatability for the frozen cells, as shown in the, um, the red graph in the bottom. So these cellular dyes um, labeled um, freeze cell ready cells uh, are suitable for a lot of targets and most cell types, um, such as um, shown here for indulgence antigens, uh, stable overexpression, or even transient expression targets. So, this platform dramatically increases the throughput and efficiency of on cell binding IC as a primary screening tool. So, next I will go over a case study um, to see how we utilize on cell binding IC to help hyperdoma screen and purify antibody affinity assessment. For this particular target, we have started with subcutaneous recombinant protein immunization. In this trial, uh, we only identified four hits out of 3,500 hyperdoma clones using a single cell population binding IC. Uh, although the hit rate is low, we confirmed the result is consistent with ELISA. So we learned that this route of immunization was not as immunogenic as we hoped. Next, we immunized mouse um, using stably target expressing cells in hook position knowing this is a cell-based immunization, which could generate antibody binders to a lot of cell surface proteins other than target of interest, we deployed a two-cell population screen. Um, parental cells were labeled with violet dye, and target-expressing cells were left unlabeled. Both cells are mixed one-to-one -one in the same well for the screen. So the flowchart shown here is a really typical example for three to four well plates, each spec indicating the cell population from the single well. Based on the intensity in the violet channel, we could differentiate the two cell type parental versus target expressing cell, and monitor the antibody binding in the um, Alexa 647 channel separately. Zooming into single well, we could visualize the dot plot of two cell population. Parental cells are circled in green, uh, sorry, in red, and then the um, target cell of circle in um, blue. So we could easily tell um, the strong bander, medium bander, weak bander, and non-bander. We used 
um, two parameters for analysis typically. So firstly, uh, we normalize a like a 647 of target cells in the sample um, to the negative isotype control. We call this fold of increase. This is used to gauge out non-benders. The higher um, this parameter, the more target-specific IgG, either at high affinity or at a higher concentration, will exist in the sample. Um, second, um, we use the ratio of target expression cell um, to, of a per, to the parental cells in the same while. Um, so we call this specific ratio. Um, this parameter is used to eliminate non-specific benders. As shown in the graph here, we identified 79 heads in the upper right quadrant based on the proposed cutoff um, thresholds. The incorporation of parental cells in the screen really eliminated some nicely binding um, hyperdoma clones cluster in the upper left quadrant. Comparing on cell binding data with ELISA data, we found that most of the heads identified in the on cell binding IC were saturated with no observer difference in the ELISA IC. So this means um, the on cell binding IC has a um, um, more dynamic range in ELISA IC. Also, there was one hit identified in the on cell binding IC uh, that was missed in the ELISA IC. So this might reflect the difference in the target protein conformation on the cells compared to that recombinant protein in the ELISA IC. So in summary, we showed here that the multiplexing of the target and the parental cell in the high throughput flow cytometry was really a powerful and physiological relevant in a cell-based immunization campaign. So similarly, we could use a multiplex methodology um, to uh, other screen as well. So in this screen, actually we're looking at the cross um, species activity for this target. So we are screening both murine target and human target in one screen. So in um, primary hyperdoma screens, we usually only evaluate a single concentration at a single point. With a single point that data, all the specific binders identified are like the information related to the affinity for the target. And so this imposes some challenge for selecting a reasonable number of heads, especially when too many are passing the threshold. Um, to quantify the concentration of antibody in hyperdoma supernatin along with the screen, we started to test the possibility of multiplexing screening cells with mouse IgG capture beads, um, which are capable of being spun down so the size should be um, reasonable along with the cells and also provide a distinguishable scattering pattern from the cells. So we finally picked such beads um, from Bounce Lab called Simple Cellular. So the size is around 8 microns and with mouse IgG um, conjugated on the, cells, on the bead surface. So the scatter plot shows here, um, you can see the XC29 XP 29F cell population is um, clear, clearly distinguished from the capture bees population. Um, so the capture bees could detect mouse plasma on and mouse IgG isotype control with 100-fold um, signal window when comparing to the no IgG containing buffer controls. Taking one 3D4 wild plate of hyperdoma clone as an example, we examined the IgG concentration with a two cell multiplex in an on cell binding IC. As illustrated in the graph to the left, we first identified uh, highlighted uh, binder based off species ratio and fold increase. Then, based on the staining intensity on the capture beads, we could take into account the IgG concentration to better understand the affinity of interest clones. So if the number of the head clones in a screen that could be handled um, is limited in a screen, um, some weak binder with high expression level indicating it's a lower affinity could be eliminated using this process. However, in our common practice, we have not used this strategy very often yet for many targets, since the head number um, has never reached our capacity yet. The whole hyperdoma process from generation to screening, to head selection, and to sequencing, it's all track in gen data biologics, which is really integrate all the clones with IC data um, easily. For the on cell binding um, screen, the raw data are exported from um, Foresight software directly and imported to gen data through adapter. 
um, which could normalize the data and also calculate the relevant parameter of interest for haze selection. In gen data, we could identify haze either based on two parameter scatter plots or multiple selection criteria criter filter. Um, the generated height list um, could be exported for manual cherry pick or transferred to um, control files for liquid handler um, to cherry pick. After height clones are confirmed, um, they will be purified for further assessment in a lot of assays, among which affinity assessment is very important. Previously, um, due to limitation in throughput, we run this in 5 to 6 point titration in 96 well um, format for bending curves. Now we can run in 384 well format uh, with duplicates of 10 point titration and three fold um, titration series. Here are examples of um, 64 antibodies and purified. In two dependent runs, we had consistent results based on affinity defined by the concentration reaching half of maximal bending, um, which called EC50, and also the maximal bending where those bending curve reach plateau, um, measured as a detection of fluorescence intensity, which has arbitrary unit. Um, so interestingly, it appeared that both Emax and EC50 um, varied for these clones. The unsolved bending IC was designed to assess the equilibrium bending properties of test antibody. Ideally, um, the EC50 was associated with the bending affinity of each antibody and according to its epitope on the target. But while Emax was more determined by the expression level of the target epitopes, the difference in the EC50 across these clones um, could be explained by the affinity difference um, due to the um, unique sequence difference in each clone. However, the variant of the variation in Emax could not simply be explained by epitope expression level, uh, since, for example, in B1, all the antibody clones are binding to the same epitope, but they do have different um, Emax. We further measured um, the kinetic property of this antibody using SPR and found that um, the Emax for the, um, this group of clones are really inversely correlated with the off-rate K-off. Um, so it means the faster the off-rate and the lower the Emax. So the two inverse correlations um, are dependent on the various lineage in the third complementary determining region of immunoglobulin variable genes for the heavy chain. Let's we um, hypothesis um, what is happening. Although the on-cell binding IC is used to measure the equilibrium property, the IC is not an in situ measurement as the washes post addition of primary and secondary antibody binding and to not just remove the excess antibodies and also result in some bound um, antibody coming off um, from the target and reaching a new equilibrium. So the new maximum binding equilibrium, which was measured on the, on the flow cytometry as Emax, could possibly be determined by the off reach and the time um, to reach a new equilibrium. So therefore, it was critical to precisely control the timing for each watch step to allow for a consistent comparison of Emax across different antibody in the test. Um, we will see the developed HTFC workflow in our hand was really designed this way to assess binding properties of test antibody and to provide reliable and high content information, not only just binding affinity, but also shedding some light on the kinetic properties to select candidates for the next step. Further, we could easily adapt other more complicated on-cell binding IC onto this automated high-throughput flow cytometry platform. For example, uh, competition IC, um, binding partner blocking IC, show in the middle, and also uh, we could do further signal amplification using tertiary antibody, etc. So all this provides some, um, us some new application opportunities for this high-throughput flow cytometry platform in antibody discovery. So to summarize, we have established an automated high throughput flow cytometry platform with the two enabling technology, high res um, integrated and modular um, robotic system, and IntelliSight IQ um, Screener Plus, the high throughput flow cytometry, and 
be successfully built on cell binding IC on this platform to screen hybridoma clones, assess affinity for purified antibodies, and other interesting ICs as well. So currently, we're exploring its use in cytokine computation and immune profiling. So that's it. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Jana, um, for your very interesting contribution there. Thanks very much. Um, so if you've just joined us, welcome. Um, can I just say, uh, I'll take this opportunity really to remind you to submit your questions uh, for our panelists uh, by filling in the Ask a Question box and pressing the OK button. And then hopefully we can address those uh, at the end of our next presentation. So our next presenter is Dr. Robert Ford uh, from Avacta Life Sciences. Um, so if you're ready, Robert, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, so um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to talk today. Um, this is my presentation um, using the IQ screener to identify specific anti-idiotypic aphemia reagents in a multiplex screen. So what are aphemia reagents? Aphemia reagents are the proprietary technology of active life sciences and are alternative to antibodies as affinity reagents. They contain two binding loops which are engineered to bind specifically to their targets and with high affinity. The scaffold is derived from cystatin um, family of protein folds and contains no post-translational modifications or cysteines within the scaffold. The two versions of the uh, library. There's one plant cystatin um, consensus sequence and also the um, Stefan A, human Stefan A. Um, one, the plant cystatin uh, is ideal for using aphemas as uh, um, affinity reagents as research diagnostics and, and the human Stefan A is ideal for therapeutics. There are nine amino acids per loop and these can be uh, randomized to bind to the targets and we can alter one or both binding loops to increase the diversity of the library. We have a phage, display, uh, a phage library of approximately 10 to the 10 um, unique molecules um, per, per library that we, we use for selections. There are many uh, advantages of uh, aphemas over uh, antibodies. For example, um, they are really easy to manufacture, so they express uh, in E. coli uh, with no penetrational uh, post-production modifications necessary. Also, they are very easily engineered, so you can create fusions uh, for uh, GFP and maltose binding protein fusions at the genetic level and express those um, uh, as you would normally and, they, and with, with, with excellent yields. Also, you can create uh, FC fusions so that you can buy antibody uh, products off the shelf uh, which recognize the FC tag. The other thing you can do is generate multimers. So in a, in a, in a way, you can, um, you can concatenate each aphema one after another, um, either as a, as a heterodimer, so you can have multiple um, aphemas uh, against different targets or, or, uh, or against the same target. Um, another advantage is that they are highly stable, so that is both in terms of thermal stability, where um, aphema reagents are stable in excess of temperatures uh, 80 degrees Celsius, and also a stable between a uh, pH range between 2 and 11. Applications of aphemia reagents uh, are vast. So a good example, which I'm going to be talking a lot in, in, in this uh, presentation, is on the amino assays. They can be used as both detection or capture reagents. Um, and um, can also be used as immunoprecipitation reagents, so you can use 
the AFMA is uh, immobilized onto beads where you can pull down um, to the target proteins from a complex mixture. Uh, you can use these to, uh, to be automated on, on a Kingfisher platform so that you can do this in a higher throughput manner. Also, uh, we use uh, AFMAs as uh, imaging reagents. So, for example, um, immunofluorescence or uh, IHC uh, on tissues or cells. And uh, because we can modify the, uh, the AFMAs uh, any way we like, we can add FC fusions. So, you, again, it's so useful that you can buy uh, custom antibodies um, with the fluorescent uh, dye conjugated to be able to perform the imaging. You can also use AFMAs as a crystallization chaperone. So, for example, uh, difficult to crystallize uh, proteins such as GPCRs um, can be um, uh, incubated in the presence of, uh, of an AFMA which is specific to that target and, and, uh, and that can act as a, as, a, as a crystallization chaperone to generate a three-dimensional structure. There's also been work from the Commando Lab um, where they uh, have used um, AFMAs as, uh, um, which are highly specific for a K6 linkage uh, and a K33 linkage uh, ubiquitin dimers, and uh, and there's a, there's a very good paper um, which which shows that on our website. There's also um, uh, capability of using AFMAs within the biosensor, uh, so such as uh, <clears throat> such as uh, lateral flow devices. So you can use AFMAs to uh, to to conjugate to uh, to gold nanoparticles or, um, or or other B types. AFMAs can also be used as affinity purification re uh, reagents. So you can immobilize the AFMA onto uh, onto some resin. And used to pull down um, um, from your target from a very complex mixture. Uh, you can use um, cleaning in place then to regenerate the column um, several times. You can also use AFMAs for protein protein inhibition. So, a good example is we have raised AFMAs against PDL1, which uh, inhibit the interaction to its natural ligand PD1. And the other thing is that we are using uh, uh, another good example in the with these idiot anti idiotypes where we've got uh, AFMAs which compete with the ligand. The other thing is uh, also, of course, in flow cytometry, you can use AFMAs as uh, detection reagents uh, to, to to test um, whether the binding of particular cell type or, or B type, which obviously I'll go into further detail. Uh, later on. And if you're very interested, um, there's, a, there's a good paper from one of my colleagues, Christian. Um, I encourage you to, to look at that if you're interested in other, other applications. So the AFMA discovery process is as follows. Typically, we uh, it takes between 12 to 14 weeks to generate uh, AFMAs against a given target. We uh, typically use uh, phase display to uh, to generate um, to enrich our our diverse library and uh, and generate uh, AFMA binders uh, against a given target. So the uh, the AFMA uh, target molecule is uh, immobilized onto the surface, and then that is uh, um, made into put into contact with uh, with our library. Uh, the library is then uh, washed to uh, to remove any uh, unbound phage, and uh, and then the uh, the phage is then eluted, and the, the, this um, is then repeated uh, further two times, and then finally from that we have um, our, our, our pan three output, which we can subclone into uh, in, in bulk into uh, an expression vector. Um, so the benefit of using uh, this approach is that you can then use the purified AFMA as, uh, as, the, um, as the reagent within the primary screens. Another good uh, example of why um, 
uh, face display is very useful in terms of um, generating the blinders is that it's possible to design a very complex uh, phase selection to drive the affinity or the specificity of of the asthma um, in the presence uh, of the deselection target so you can um, drive the specificity towards um, a molecule say for example within the anti-idiotypic binders um, you can drive specificity towards uh, the therapeutic drug and remove asthma that bind to the isotype um, FC domain. You can um, <clears throat> typically screen up to 384 asthma per um, per plate on using the IQ screener with multiplex options of up to 30 different target proteins with the death screen beads. Because the death screen beads can be easily separated based on their fluorescence characteristics it's possible to immobilize different targets onto these beads and use uh, the aphomas to probe these beads in one well uh, in a multiplex fashion. Following um, the, um, the primary screen that um, we have used to identify the binders, uh, we will um, we'll do a small scale expression and purification of the top candidates and do further validation work on that. So in this example, I'm going to talk about uh, for the anti-idiotypic aphomas, uh, the validation was mainly ELISA-based. But uh, if, uh, if, there are, if the customer or project um, required, there are other validation possibilities as well. So the IQ primary screen that we use um, we have two different assays that we have designed in-house. One of these, that, uh, which is uh, the schematic is on screen now, is termed the forward assay, where we immobilize the target protein onto the death screen beads using uh, activated beads. Um, we can attach streptavidin to each of the 30 beads and uh, use different biotinylated targets to immobilize onto each of the beads. We then use our HA tag asthma to probe the, um, the targets in, uh, in the well and uh, any aphomas that bind to the uh, targets of interest are, are then detected using an anti-HA alexafluor detection reagent. You can also uh, use um, up to three different cell types in the same well so it really is a very um, high throughput method and uh, you're able to multiplex a large amount of different um, targets on there to get real a, a lot of data uh, on across the activity profile of each aphoma um, using this method. The other uh, method that we use uh, is what we call the, the reverse IQ screener assay and this is um, immobilizing the anti-HA antibody onto beads and then use the beads to pull down the uh, HA tagged aphema out of solution and then we are able to see whether the aphema will bind to the target which is biotinylated and then we use a streptavidin detection with, uh, with a conjugated fluorescent dye. So um, this brings me on to the next part of my talk where I'm going to describe um, the um, project where we're looking at antigen competing anti uh, idiotypic uh, aphomas against the therapeutic molecule adalimumab. Adalimumab is a TNF alpha inhibiting anti-inflammatory drug which is used to treat uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease and other uh, diseases. It's also uh, sold under the trade name uh, Humira and uh, it's uh, um, one of the, the, the biggest um, selling drugs uh, in, in the world to date. So what are anti-idiotypic uh, affinity reagents? So anti-idiotype uh, affinity reagents are molecules which bind specifically to the idiotype of an antibody. The idiotype is the unique uh, set of variable residues typically found in the uh, CDRs which defines that particular antibody. 
there are three types of anti-idiotopic reagents. Um, competing anti-idiotopic reagents, which is uh, what I'm going to talk about here. Non-competing anti-idiotopic reagents and complex specific. So competing um, uh, are aphemers uh, affinity reagents that bind to the palatope of the monoclonal antibody and compete with its target antigen. So these are used to measure free drug. Non-competing are ones which bind near the palatope but still allow the antibody to bind to its target. So these measure total drug. And then finally, the complex specific are uh, affinity reagents which bind specifically to the complex but not to the unbound uh, antibody or unbound, or, or unbound target. So during the process of that therapeutic antibody development, antibodies are really useful for, to be able to monitor the drug levels in preclinical and clinical samples so that you know when to dose individuals uh, following treatment. So the phase display strategies for generating anti uh, uh, aphemer reagents which are competing is, is really simple in terms of um, in, in terms of the strategy. So aphemer reagents readily bind to the competing um, um, surface of the antibody. So um, we usually immobilize the uh, therapeutic antibody onto uh, streptavidin and, uh, and then perform the phase display. And deselection is generally performed against the antibody scaffold to prevent any FC binders. In this instance, we use the anti-TNF-alpha IgG1 from Invivagen, which is a, an adalimumab um, biosimilar, so taking the CDRs from adalimumab and drafting it onto an IgG1 scaffold, and this was used to raise the, uh, the aphemers against. We have performed many other projects uh, with uh, different um, anti um drugs, so amongst these uh, is, is trastuzumab. From the trastuzumab selections, we have had a, uh, during a collaboration, we got uh, Covance uh, to perform a, 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 an external evaluation uh, with these products. So following the uh, phase display, uh, we took the uh, phase output and subcloned that into uh, expression vector. We produced uh, 384 different uh, aphema uh, reagents um, expressed in a small scale. We normalized the uh, concentration and uh, probed um, different um, immobilized proteins within the same bead set. So in this example in the forward assay, we probed uh, beads against IgG1 SC, anti HCD20, which is a rituximab biosimilar, anti CTLA4, which is an ipilimumab biosimilar, and the anti TNF alpha. Um, and as you can see with the blue bars, uh, we generated 15 unique aphemer candidates which were specific to the anti TNF alpha and did not cross react with uh, any of the other targets. With the reverse assay, this is where we immobilized the aphemer onto the beads. As you can see in the yellow, the, um, the best forward candidate doesn't necessarily mean is the best capture candidate, um, but that is all com completely normal. Following the IQ screening assay, these 15 aphemers were further characterized um, by uh, expressing these unique aphemers again uh, in a medium scale so to generate more material and uh, these were characterized by ELISA. The format of the ELISA is that the aphema was captured onto a maxi salt plate and we used a biotinylated um, adalumumab um, biosimilar and then come in with the strep HRP. The biotinylated adalumumab was titrated from a high concentration to a low concentration to generate EC50 curves and this was in order to to rank the aphema binders. As you can see in the graph, 
in grey are the 15 uh, aphemers along with uh, negative controls and uh, in red is the um, TNF alpha ligand. So as you can see, a couple of the aphemers are equivalent to the uh, TNF alpha ligand uh, and as they have a, a similar EC50 binding profile. You can also see from this uh, graph that there are uh, various different asthma clones which have different affinities to the targets. So we took the two best uh, candidates and performed cross-reactivity profiling against uh, other therapeutic uh, drugs uh, such as trastuzumab and uh, the biosimilars uh, anti-CD20 and CKLA4 along with the human IgG1 scaffold and as you can see the aphemers do not cross-react with any of the other targets. We also performed um, serum matrix of, uh, testing, so we wanted to check that the aphemers were not um, affected by different matrices, so in this instance of serum, and uh, from this we got a ULLOQ of 1000 nanogram per mil and a, a lower limit quantification of 4 nanogram per mil and the percentage CV and the percentage recovery were uh, within the FDA guidelines. So the good thing about the AFMA technology is that the, the, um, within, the, within the clinical range of, the, uh, of, of um, the assay and also you can do assay uh, development so that uh, you can tweak the sensitivity and the um, dynamic range of the assay. Okay, so this is coming on to the next part of my talk, which is about uh, generating aphemers against the anti adalimumab uh, complex. And from, in this instance, we used um, a different phase display strategy. So to drive the um, specificity, uh, we were able to look at um, uh, deselecting against the free drug. So this is a, a more challenging way of um, doing the selection because as you can see there is, uh, there is not as much area uh, for the aphema to bind to the, to, the, uh, to the complex. So we, um, we performed this in the presence of uh, twofold molar excess of TNF alpha ligands, and we used uh, deselection against the antibody targets to drive the antibody complex specificity. We performed uh, complex um, specific anti idiotype projects before and have had success with trastuzumab and uh, anti vitamin D antibodies and anti estradiol. So, following the phase display, um, we again did the subcloning uh, using a, a bulk cloning method and picked individual colonies and um, performed the IQ uh, on um, 384 clones. Uh, in this instance, we had to run two forward assays in parallel. So one forward assay, which, uh, which, which have uh, blue bars, uh, is in the absence of TNF alpha ligand and uh, green bars show the, uh, in the presence of TNF alpha ligand. So any aphemers which showed preferential binding to the complex, uh, we, we, we decided to take forward um, to, to do uh, further validation work on. As you can see in the, the, the red bars uh, show that when we immobilize the aphema, they detect the, the, uh, the antibody drug um, target complex. Following um, this uh, the primary screen, we, um, we expressed the 19 candidates uh, in, in medium scale and performed um, capture ELISA using immobilized aphema, and then we fixed the antibody therapeutic drug concentration and titrate TNF alpha concentration so to get a dose dependent response of the complex. In this instance, we used an anti-human IgG uh, HRP to, uh, to detect the asthma complex. As you can see, um, we had uh, 
in on the um, first 18, uh, well, sorry, 19 um, atomers, we had 18 binders which were able to recognize the complex. And on the far right hand side is a um, is an antigen competing um, atomer, as you can as you'd expect as you increase the molar ratio of TNF alpha, you start to see inhibiting uh, effects. Whereas with the complex specific atomers, you see a titration of uh, atoma, uh of um, of response of uh, when you titrate the TNF alpha. We also performed an ELISA against TNF-alpha alone, and uh, this slide demonstrates that uh, only one of these atomers is, uh, is, is detecting only in the presence of TNF-alpha. Following um, the initial um, titration, uh, we, uh, we further optimized uh, the assay so that we uh, titrated the TNF alpha further, and we took the three best candidates and repeated this experiment. And from this, we generated EC50 curves, and um, from the three best binders, the one in blue um, shows a, a sensitivity of less than 100 picogram per mil of uh, TNF alpha in solution. We repeated this uh, in the presence of um, titrating TNF-alpha with different fixed concentrations of uh, anti-TNF-alpha antibody. And we see um, a still very sensitive, uh, even at uh, as low a fixed concentration as 0.1 microgram per mil. We also then wanted to check that even though the uh, asthma selections was based on the uh, biosimilar, so the CDRs uh, drafted onto an IgG framework of adalimumab, we wanted to check that it was definitely going to bind to the adalimumab therapeutic itself. So we um, repeated the experiment with the lead candidate clone uh, using adalimumab and titrating TNF-alpha and also the biosimilar. And as you can see from these curves, the, um, the the comparison between the two uh, was indistinguishable, showing that the atomers are able to bind the, the complex irrespective of, the, of the, uh, the, the scaffold. We repeated uh, this uh, experiment uh, in the presence and absence of serum um, using a fixed concentration of 1 microgram per mil adalimumab and also 0.1 microgram per mil adalimumab and titrating TNF alpha. And as you can see, you get a, a really nice dose-dependent response based on um, irrespective of when it's in the presence or absence of serum. So to summarize, the IT screener is a very powerful tool to identify anti-idiotypic asthma reagents uh, against the uh, adalimumab. Uh, the forward assays can be used in a multiplex fashion. And, um, can identify the specificity of atomers uh, to their target, um, and the reverse assays are able to confirm that the atomers are, are able to perform as capture reagents. Complex-specific and linking competing anti-idiotypic atomers were successfully characterized, which demonstrate the versatility of the atomer reagent technology for the generation of different types of anti-idiotypic affinity reagents. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Robert. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, we've got a few minutes uh, for a couple of uh, questions. Um, and um, the first one I'd like to ask, and I'm going to direct this one to Jana, if you're still with us. <clears throat> um, Jana, this is from uh, Chawa Chaipan uh, from Novartis. Uh, and he says, thank you for a super talk. Um, he has a question concerning the multiplexing assay of beads and hydrodoma uh, cells. Um, can you determine the concentration of the IgGs bound to the beads by using the IQ, and, and how sensitive is the assay? 
Okay, uh, I'll, I think um, when we use the mouse anti um, mouse capture um, mouse IgG capture beads from um, from bounce lab, so we did a titration curve used just um, IgG. So we did a really sharp transition, and then I think the detection range um, um, the the signal window is pretty nice, like when they go to like a microgram range. Um, but since I think we're using the anti haze um, to detect to detect them, and then um, oh, sorry, I got it back. So the transition is really sharp. Um, so we couldn't really um, either, it, we, we use it more like a qualitative information instead of using um, to, to get the concentration. It's more like a yes, no answer. So if you want to use it to get the um, get real concentration of the IgG in the, um, in the hyperdoma, you really need um, really optimize to get a nice uh, um, anti-mouse capture um, to optimization, et cetera. So we didn't really do further. We just used that for more like um, yes and no. Um, relatively answer, yeah, I'll put it that way. Excellent. Um, one for you, Robert. Um, how long did it take to run your primary screens on the IQ Screener platform? It typically takes uh, 45 minutes to run the uh, IQ plate. <clears throat> uh, but typically, uh, in terms of the um, generation of the AFIMA from the phage, uh, it takes um, four weeks to uh, subclone and then produce the AFIMAs in small scale to do the normalization and then to, to run the assay. So uh, in parallel, we also uh, sequence every clone as well. So then we can align the sequencing results to the, to the uh, IQ data and, uh, and then rank the binders in terms of the um, binding characteristics and are able to then uh, select the unique candidates. So that's, that process takes four weeks. Good, thank you. Uh, one for you, Yana. Um, could you multiplex the cell and cytokine assays? Oh, yes. Um, so now in the primary screen, so um, in a T cell activation IC, actually um, we, could, we use the IQ um, um, cytokine detection beads and also um, some um, T cell activation marker detection antibody and mix them together. Um, so we could do um, we could do the simultaneous detection of um, cytokine and the T cell activation, but not in the um, in this uh, hyperdoma um, screening um, okay. scenario. Yep. All right, and one more question for you, Jan, before we go. What do you think were the key benefits of the IQ versus ELISA uh, and standard flow cytometry platforms? Yeah, I think versus ELISA, based on our data, I think I, the, this on cell binding first is more physiological relevant. I think all the antigen expression on the cell surface um, is much physiological relevant to learn the recombinant protein. And also, I think in terms of dynamic window um, for detection of different um, um, binding um, um, intensity, it's, more, uh, it's much better than ELISA. So for ELISA, it's really easy to get saturated. When you get a hit, it's more, most on the saturation level. But when you look at the, um, um, the on-cell binding IQ data, you see the, a range of um, differential differentiation. Um, so I think, yeah, this is comparing IQ versus ELISA. I think also comparing IQ with other um, flow cytometer. I think since this is really play-based data, and also um, it's really um, low volume and then high speed, so it really um, give us the throughput which required for the primary screen. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Look, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we've run out of time, sadly, um, but... Please remember uh, that the webinar will be uh, available uh, on, on the Drug Discovery World website. So that's www.ddw-online.com. That's ddw-online.com. And that will be available for the next six months or so. Um, once again, a big thank you to our speakers <clears throat> and also to our sponsor, uh, Intellisite Corporation, who uh, obviously uh, manufacture the IQ system. Uh, may I also thank you, our attendees, and hope you'll join us for another DW we webinar uh, in the very near future. Uh, 
thank you very much and goodbye.